it's cliche, right, to say that, you know, minorities have to work three times as hard as everybody else. But you know what? We do. We have to stop and take a minute mm-hmm. and do it the old fashioned way. Get a pen and paper. Mm. Map out your steps. Where do you see yourself in five years? What would you like to be doing? What are you passionate about? have an exciting guest with an incredible story. Uh, you know, on our podcast, we like to focus on people who follow their inspiration and uh, really kind of just get to know them and how they go from point A to point B. Um, so that's what we're going to do here today with Lola. Hi. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Lola. So we're at Lola's beautiful home here in Queens, New York. Thank you for having us. Welcome. Welcome. So tell us a little bit about yourself. Uh, you came from Mexico when you were a child. Tell us a little bit about that journey. And... Yeah, well, my, my parents came here as tourists um, with me in arms. And, you know, they were coming with a lot more of a long-term plan at the, at the moment. Yeah. And then that's how we ended up here. I was six months old at the time. So I pretty much was almost born and raised here, but I wasn't born here. And I, I always remember the really scary part about about getting through immigration, which was when, when they look at my mom and they say, well, you're here on vacation. Why is your daughter with you? Mm. And she like thought on her toes and she's like, I'm breastfeeding. <laughs> They're like, okay, stamp, stamp, go. Nice. And they were like, okay, we made it. <laughs> she had that New York attitude <laughs> quick. She was quick on her feet. She was quick, yeah. Um, and, you know, we lived for a little bit in Hell's Kitchen. My dad held like two jobs. Then, you know, obviously I don't remember any of that. For the most part, we came to Queens when I was like six years old. And I've been here since. Yeah. Wow. New York. Why New York? Why'd your parents fit? I, I, I know usually Texas, Arizona, California kind of. Well, there's a little bit of a, of a historical uh, element to just Mexican migration to New York City in general. Right. So there's. Um, the Mixteca region in Mexico is where three states uh, come together. And in the 70s, they suffered a really, uh, they're mostly agricultural communities, right? And they suffered a really severe drought. And at that point, they were forced to look for, you know, their livelihoods elsewhere. And some of the uh, folks that had already come to the states, in states such as Oregon, more like the southern, you know, where they were used as a uh, literally for their arms and and the program was called the bracero program which if the word bracero the word brazo means arms in spanish wow. um when those permits were done and some folks went back home and some didn't and some discovered that there were there was a really um high need a niche for them to fill in service sector jobs and so some of them went to chicago some of them ended up in new york and all it took was for a few you know uncles to come to New York and then they start to bring the cousins and the nephews and that's how the migration starts Mm. and then so now we're in Queens amazing yeah and a beautiful area beautiful home yeah it's almost like um um our little sanctuary right because you're not in the middle of all the bustling busyness of of Manhattan yeah Times Square or all the buildings it's just you know one two family homes and I wish the kids these days would would go outside and play some more, right? They don't do that. But when I grew up in Queens, yeah, we went outside to play, you know, freeze tag, kick the can, what have you, until like our moms were calling us to come inside and it was like, you know, eight o'clock. Yeah. And it started to get dark. Yeah, exactly. So you grew up in Queens. Um, You know, let's kind of just brush through. What was it like growing up? Uh, Both Um, parents? Yeah, Um, both my parents, uh, you know, we're all, they're still alive, thank God. I mean, they, they're very hardworking people, like uh, really, you know, true immigrant story. My dad worked two jobs for a little bit while my mom raised my myself and my two brothers. And they, my dad scraped up, up enough money to like, you know, set up a business of his own. He had his first restaurant. And then my mom worked there too. But then that also meant that, you know, my, my childhood growing up happened to be very short-lived, if you will, because I had to mature really quickly. There were, there was no one that could, you know, watch us, you know, while my mom was helping dad at the restaurant and their days were very long. I mean, they would close at four in the morning. Wow. Um, but you know, thanks to that, we're, I, I get it. Maybe back then I didn't understand it. Yeah. You know, my, my, my parents, they 
day off was a Tuesday, wow. which was weird because I wouldn't see them on the weekends. And I would come home from school on a Tuesday and they're like conked out in bed, catching up on sleep. Yeah. Um, so that was tough. That was tough. And I had to like look after my, my brothers. It was kind of like I'd come home and my mom would pretty much go, here's your brother. Mm. Food's on the stove. You can heat it up. There's laundry that has to be taken out. And I just, she's like, I'll see you later. Okay. Right. Until, you know, finally, again, as a result of the migration, thanks to family reunification, more women, immigrant women were starting to come because for a while there in the 80s, it was predominantly men. Mm. So even if my mom wanted help or, or to find someone to watch us, like a nanny or a babysitter or whatever, there wasn't anyone. Right. So I was it for a little while. Right. That must have been hard. I mean, especially as a teenager or young, you had to grow up and kind of help help around the household and keep that family unity. Yeah. I'm sure that had effects for that time. Maybe you grew to understand it, but... It did. I yeah. got married very young. And as a result, I did not want to have children for the good part of my beginning years of my marriage. So, yeah. you know, I waited five years and everyone, you know, that's just the culture, right? When are you going to have a kid? And I'm like, I... We'll at some point, I'm just not ready right now. So, right. Um, but I'm glad I did it that way. Now, after high school, you go to college. Yeah. Uh, I seen co uh, pictures of you in college earlier. Yes. So where'd you go? So I went through the New York City public school system. I went oh. to Hillcrest High School out in Jamaica, Queens. After high school, I was the first in my family to go to college. Wow. And I went to an all women's college. I went to Bryn Mawr College, which was at the time uh, and still is today one of the top colleges was compared to like a women's Harvard. Is that here in New York? Or? It isn't. It's in Pennsylvania. Oh, which it's in Pennsylvania. Was, yeah, which was a difficult pill to swallow for my parents because, right. and I'm exaggerating when I say this, in our culture, a woman doesn't really leave her home unless she's getting married or going to the convent. I'm exaggerating. No, but I know true. Rarely, <laughs> rarely would it be for, you know, to get an education. It's like, oh my gosh, there's so many great schools here. You have to go all the way over there. <laughs> right. Um, so that was, that was rough. To be the first one to go was really hard. But really how did hard. it feel for you when you got there? Was it exciting to be away from home and to, to be independent? It was um, exciting, but it was frightening, and I felt like I had a, a lot of expectations on my back. And I get there, and coming from a city where there's so much diversity, I felt for the first time like a minority. I was mm. like, oh boy. Predominantly white, white I'm assuming? White institution, yes. Okay. And yeah, very wealthy women right. went there, like, you know, diplomats' daughters and presidents, okay. kids, and whatever. whatever. So, I mean, it was eye-opening in that respect. So I got to meet women from a lot of different backgrounds. Sure. Um, yeah. And also, I think got in touch with my own culture because being in a place that made me feel like it was so absent made me want to recreate it for myself. Mm, that makes sense. I became president of the Latina Association. I was very active on campus. We have um, a tradition, May Day, right? So they celebrate May Day on campus. I brought the first mariachi band ever to campus and <laughs> nice. it was great. <laughs> and then like, I also like for the uh, national Latino heritage month, the closing, you know, dance, instead of having a DJ play salsa and merengue, we, I, I brought a cumbia band from New York city <laughs> wow. and they played, you know, and That's it cool. was, um, you know, it, it was interesting. You know, there was like Puerto Rican, Mexican, there was people from, um, uh, Costa Rica. I, I uh. met people from so many countries but to see them come together. Yeah. And I was able to bring them together. That was like new and that was fun. And That's then I was cool. like, okay, I think I enjoy this and I want to do this as much as I can is share my culture yeah. and let everyone know that they can partake in it. You know? Yeah, no, I agree. I, th I think it's, I think there's so much power in knowing your culture, um, uh, having pride for it and then sharing it with other people because it's how we, I mean, that's the melting pot, right? That's it is. And that's one of the great things about this city. Yeah. And this is probably why I'll never move. Yeah, New York. New York is electrifying. It always feels so good coming back. Um, yeah. Okay, so college, college, you're there, you're, 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 you're meeting new people. Uh, what did you decide your studies as far as what got you into your studies? And I was pre-med in college uh, with a major in anthropology, which is, haha, -ha, as, you know, luck would have it. 
I love cultures, right? And I love studying all that. The pre-med thing didn't work out. Because <laughs> back then it was like really, really, really stringent. And, you know, truth be told, I, in retrospect, I realize and am aware that the public school system was, the New York City public school system was great. But it does have its limitations. And I was competing with people that had private tutors and had, you know, extra classes and were coming from like, you know, these world-class institutions. And it's not to say that I, I couldn't compete. It's just you can't know what you don't know. Mm. I just wasn't prepared. Um, anyway, so I, I get an internship at Merrill Lynch the summer between my freshman and sophomore year. And then I did it again the following summer. And I was like, oh, I kind of like this. And um, so when I graduated, coming finally to terms with the fact that I wasn't going to be going to medical school because I didn't feel like I could, I should have sat for the, for the MCAT. I didn't, maybe I, maybe I shortchanged myself in that respect. Mm. Um, but I just wasn't happy. I wasn't feeling like my grades were, were competitive enough. And I, I taught myself uh, out, of, out of doing that. And, um, you know, I helped at the family business for a little while. Now my parents have a second restaurant at the time. Um, for a little while I did that and I'm like, okay, let me get myself together. And I reached back out to the uh, folks at Merrill that had hired me for the internships. And they said, we're sorry, we don't have a position for you right now, but give us your resume and we know someone who does. And um, that's what I did. And now that I look back, I, I, I understand why they did it that way. It's not that they didn't have a position for me because they loved me. They, they gave me great reviews when I, when I ended my internships. It's that they were smart businesswomen. They mm -hmm. let someone else train me for a year. A year to the day, I get a phone call. We have a position for you. Wow. <laughs> really? Yeah. And it was just smart business on their part. That's I mean, genius. That's brilliant. So they let you go over there to train him, but they kept... But they knew they that knew. they were gonna, yeah. They wow. knew that, that they had a that in, I had a great work ethic, that I was responsible, that I was a go getter, that I they knew who I was. Wow. Um, and then that's how my career gets started in in finance. Then I was at Merrill Lynch for like a good eight years. I had my two children while I was working there, and it was tough during that time because I didn't want to stop working. Because I saw that in order for you to continue to climb the ladder, you can't you can't leave that that chair empty because someone else will get your job. Yeah, it just wasn't never has been really a, a women friendly career path. Mm. It's been tough. It has been, you know, a boys club for the longest time, and I think right. it's until recently that um, there's more embracing of women and even diversity you know in general sure. like never mind men women just diversity in general right um so i was there for like eight years uh working with domestic clients and then someone hired me i got an offer to go to um smith barney which later on became morgan stanley to work for an international team and it was great because i got to use my spanish I got oh. to deal with, you know, Latino clientele, but like Latino clientele from Latin America, which was right. really great. And I kind of finally felt that all the things that I was about were coming together and 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 fitting into place. Wow, these are these are big institutions. I mean these they are, are these are iconic New York, well, global, but yeah. New and York institutions. So it's it's a lot of prestige just working in these companies. You know, after fourteen and a half years at Morgan Stanley, I decided to, you know, just look, freshen up my surroundings, um, maybe look for a little bit change in culture. And I, I ended up at UBS, where I am now, and I'm there as a Suiza Senior Wealth Strategy Associate. Wow. And um, I love it there. It's like, mine, but I don't even know what that means. <laughs> That's like so above my uh, pay grade that this podcast is not so much focused about a destination, but it's how does somebody out there watching that that has a dream or, or, or an idea that they want to go towards this? How do they get the courage, find the, 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 the way to go? So, but that also means hearing when people say something like my dream was to be this 
And why did it but change? The, the ironic thing is that I wasn't the only one. There must have, I must have been surrounded by at least five financial advisors that had the same thing happen wow. to them. They wanted to be doctors. <laughs> and it's not like, oh, I wanted to be, I don't know, a fireman or a policeman. It's like, I wanted to be a doctor. Yeah. And then when that didn't work out, I'm here. It's right. just strange. But then I realized why we were able to segue into that career path is because we still are doctors on some level yeah of people's people finances people's money yeah and there's a lot of emotion uh, tied to tied to people's you know finances true that's there's a great true, point never heard it that there's way. true stories you know there's yeah. just stories about how people came into their money or how they lost their money or how they inherited their money or you know maybe you know you're you're a, a fem- you know you're a woman or a sole practitioner who doesn't have the time to tend to her finances because you're so busy focused on your law practice or what have you. We really are doctors of, of money. Wow, I love that. I've never heard it that way and I love that. <laughs> no, no, seriously, like you're right. You think about what's what's the what's the the highest cause of stress? I'd imagine I'm not a doctor, but I would imagine what causes people most stress and anxiety is finance. finances. Um and what is the most important thing to secure in life? I mean, aside from the, you know, the spiritual and the, but finance. I mean, you can't put your kids into the right place or through college. So you're right. You're a doctor. You're taking people's most valuable asset aside from their children. But, and you're diversifying it and you're teaching them how to secure it. and How to manage how it. How to and, manage and, you it. Know, what would be best for them. You know, Let it work for them. Right. Wow. Wow. I mean, that there's sort of so thing. many things. So that's, yeah, you're a doctor. You're a finance doctor. <laughs> um, no, that, that's actually great. Also, I wanted to say like, it's interesting in life how we sometimes things just segue into, and we're so good at it. Like you. Yeah, well, sometimes the universe will take you where you need to go without you trying that hard. Mm. Mm. Which I find is just a natural occurrence of how things should be. Yeah. You know, it's almost like um, I've encountered a lot of folks in the industry, maybe a little more junior to me or that were in positions that were more junior to me. And maybe they weren't necessarily part of the team that I was on. But if I was able to mentor them informally without saying I am your mentor. Yeah. I gave them guidance and then they were able to take the next step. Um. Mm. Or maybe, you know, hey, you're really smart. Maybe you should look at this opportunity. And then next thing you know, they're like, wow, I'm so glad you encouraged me to like look. So National Core is the company that, that um, is behind this podcast. And basically, uh, my job is to come out and find inspiring people like yourself with stories that that we could we could get out to people, you know, people that are, are looking to find their way. Or uh, so one of the things you just mentioned was mentorship. And um, it's another thing that this podcast, we hope that this podcast does. It's important to talk about how do we, in a society, what maybe starting off small in our inner circle, find people that have that. And and how how do you find somebody, give to them so they can launch? I honestly think that as a mom, it's more of a spiritual thing that I do. Because I would like to think that now that I have two girls or young ladies are 18 and 21 now, I want to kind of just put good vibes out there and mentor folks. Why? Because not for this reason, but because I would hope that someone would do the same for my kids. Mm -hmm. And it's a little bit more of like comes from a place of empathy. There were times in my life that I, I really felt I could have used mentorship. Like, perhaps if I had had a mentor or a little bit more, you know, of a, of a pre-med counselor in college or something like that, that. Like, I too could have benefited from mentorship. And I guess from my experiences where I lacked it, um, make me want to do it. Sometimes it's just a matter of providing not just words of encouragement, but just flat out guidance. I like to do that. Just that's my nature. I called in for like help with like some silly fee in my checking account. And somehow the woman's system like got stuck. And she's like, I'm sorry, my system's spinning. I said, it's okay, you know. And I'm like, where are you? And then I kind of like, you know, we're just killing time. And she tells me where she is calling, you know, she's at the call center. 
And then we start talking for some reason, one thing led to the next. Women talk a lot. We do that by <laughs> nature. Um, she's telling me that, you know, she, she wanted to buy a home and now she couldn't and blah, blah, blah. And I said, well, you know, she started to tell me a little bit about her personal situation and I started to give her like tips. She didn't ask me, but I could hear that she just needed a little guidance. Mm. And after like the three, four minute monologue that I, I, I took on and get, where I gave her just basic financial advice, she said, wow, she goes, before I'd spoken to you, I felt discouraged. And now I feel directed. Wow. And when she said that, my heart just like sang. I'm like, wow, I, I did something good for someone today. I'm happy. Like if, yeah. I, if I went tonight, I would go happy. Yeah. And so wow. with mentorship, I really wish, you know, and encourage folks that um, if you see someone that's kind of like going astray, and I know sometimes it could be, you know, unsolicited advice, just tap them on the shoulder and say, are you okay? And mm. just hear them out. Because sometimes when you hear them out, it's just a matter of helping them um, put their thoughts in order and providing that guidance, yeah. you know, to get them to where they need to go. I love that. Um, and so I do that as much as I can, just because I enjoy it. That's great. And, and you know, we need that. Uh, it just seems today we live in a time where most people just want to be TikTok stars and YouTube star and and make a lot of money quick and there's we're losing the idea of just going one step to the next and building over time. So do you think that's still a reality that people could build a financial future or are people are we losing hope on that and you have to move no, quick? No, I think that that's most certainly still a reality. I mean, what you're what you're describing right now is mm -hmm. what I call technology induced ADD. So uh -huh. much information coming at us towards us, and there's so many things. You know, I, I'm, I'm guilty too. I'm not gonna deny the fact that, like, yeah, I'll look at my phone for two seconds, and next thing you know, you go down the Facebook <laughs> or Instagram rabbit hole, and you're like, oh my god, five minutes just went by. <laughs> Oh, and the market moved now. Just kidding. Uh, but, you know, um, we have to stop and take a minute mm -hmm. and do it the old-fashioned way. Get a pen and paper. Mm. Map out your steps. Where do you see yourself in five years? What would you like to be doing? What are you passionate about? And I think that if you're, e e even if you have, even if your answer to where do you see yourself in five years is, I'm not really sure, but if you start with what are you passionate about, surely you'll get there at some point. Mm, I like that. I like that. That that's important for. I like that's a that's a gem to me. You know, just taking the time out, getting a pen and paper, and starting at the basics. Uh, and, and I feel like it's. I'm I'm really on a weight loss journey right now, and it's the same. It's like I've I, I've gone up and down for years, and sometimes you just got to sit down, write out your meal plan. It's that simple. It's eat this yeah. and do this much Flat exercise. Ahead. You know, another thing, I started doing it for different reasons. I started doing it literally for my mental health yeah. and my health In instead general. of doing it to look good. Right. And that changed. And I think that could that goes with finances or career paths, which you just said. Find something you're interested in instead of find what pays the most. Right. Instead of saying, I want to be a criminal defense lawyer because they make more than, you know, a public defender. I mean, I don't right. know if that's yeah, a good yeah. analogy, but, you know, it's right. it's finding what you're passionate about and then going that way. I, I heard a saying, if you do what you love, you'll never work a day in your life. Right. Find what you love is the most important thing, what you're passionate about. Right. And then figure out how to monetize that, I guess, or... Um, okay, so let's 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 talk a little bit. So you have two daughters. Yep. Husband. Husband. Yes. Um, your daughters are in college. They're, they're in college. Yes. Okay. Do Which you, is it's super weird for me to say that I'm an empty nester, though I don't know how long that's going to last because everyone seems to be coming home after they graduate <laughs> for a little while. Um, you know, oftentimes I get asked, "Are you sad? Both your girls are gone." And I'm like, "No, I'm nobody's <laughs> human alarm. I'm nobody's chauffeur." <laughs> I don't have to be on someone else's schedule. No. Can we I love my girls. Can we shout out the fact that you are the first 
person in the family to go to college. You introduced a new yeah. level to your her to to your family tree, and now both of your daughters are continuing that, and that's the American dream. I'm incredibly proud of my girls. Um, they both attend really great schools. One of them goes to her sinus college and I'm very active on the parent leadership council there. I love that school. So people go, er, what? I've never heard of it. Her sinus, it's in this book called the uh, colleges that changed lives. And it's a small liberal arts college in Pennsylvania. And it's really great for folks that want like the small college feel, don't want to get lost. Uh, really great for like the biomedical, molecular biology, science wow. folks. Like it's really, and it combines sports. They have football. They have like, it's a really nice, well-rounded, small community. And my daughter has thrived. She's a senior now. She's going to graduate in May. And I cannot believe that I'm, I'm going to have a child that will be fully graduated. Like I, <laughs> I never thought this day would come. And then my youngest uh, is at her freshman year right now in Cornell. It was a lot of work. Wow. So it was really a family effort. So I'm proud of them, the way, the way they've, they turned out so far. So far, you know, like knock on wood, we pray that they're going to do and are confident that they're going to do bigger and better things. I have no doubt. Your husband sounds like an incredible man. He's our biggest cheerleader. Yeah. And we have to, him to thank for incredible support throughout the years. Um, brilliant man. Chemical engineer um, wow. by school and trade. But when he emigrated to this country, he came for me. So I'm really cognizant of the fact that he probably left a brilliant career in that field behind in, in his country in Mexico to come here for me. And also came from Mexico. Also came wow. from Mexico. So did you guys meet? Was it? Uh, in Mexico. We met you there. Met in Mexico. In, in one of my uh, college winter breaks, I went there and we met. Nice. And then we dated long distance. This was like pre-texting, pre-email. And I remember I would bug him. I'd be like, go to, go, to the, go to the computer center. Don't you have one? I know you have one at the Polytechnic University. Get an email account. He's like, email? What is that? <laughs> and sure. it was, um, you know, letters through snail mail. Like, you know, they'd take two weeks to get there. And by the time they got there, we probably already spoke about what we wrote in the letter. And it was yeah. like, okay, you know, you get the letter and it was just cool to relive it. And it was, Get those butterflies in yeah. your stomach, like, and even it, though you know, you're like, we spoke already, I but know, still. I know, I know. You'd get the letter, you're like, oh my God, a letter. <laughs> um, and it was, it was tough. It wasn't easy to do. It was three years long distance. And wow. this was before calling cards. Like, we didn't, remember calling cards? Yeah, absolutely. It was like a dollar a minute to talk. <laughs> right. It was like, I remember I graduated, and my dad's going to kill me because I'm, I'm going to tell you guys this, but I was like, Dad, um, I have an $800 phone bill that I need to pay or I won't get my oh. diploma. He was like, wait, what? I was like, I'll pay you back, I promise. And this is how I ended up working at the family restaurant. <laughs> work it <laughs> off. Work it off. <laughs> um, but yeah, no, um, I mean, we're, we're blessed as a family. My, my husband's hardworking. He's now the assistant, one of the assistant chiefs at in the for the city department wow. buildings um he's kind of like on the shire side he doesn't really like to talk too much about yeah. that stuff but um well i had the honor i got to meet him so uh super cool guy uh <laughs> tried to get him tried to get him on the video it wasn't happening uh, so he came for you he came yeah. and uh you guys set up shop in new york you're and 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 i know we won't go through the whole thing but you came you guys had ha had your children here what was the teamwork? Because it sounds like there's an incredible amount of teamwork. And I want to I wanna ask this in the question of your parents as well had an incredible, from what I'm hearing, amount of teamwork. But it was still different. They were running a business and the family had to come together, which is I love. Um, you guys came together. You as a young teen taking care of your siblings while they're running the restaurant. What was, what was it like with your kids? What, it, what was the difference that, of how you and your husband raised your kids? But I'm trying to connect how you grew up and your parents had to work yeah. because of their field to make it happen. Was there a difference in your guys' home life, the way you raised your kids? Was there more family dinners, more time with your kids? There definitely was more time with my kids, but I am not going to lie. I was never... A stay-at-home mom because like I said I didn't feel like I had that luxury and I know 
it's cliche, right, to say that, you know, minorities have to work three times as hard as everybody else. But you know what? We do. We yeah. don't have the luxury of staying home because your position is going to be given to someone younger, yeah. you know, who's willing to maybe do the job for less, what have right. you. So I would do my maternity leaves and go back to work. And for, I want to say, the better part of their of their growing up, I mean, nannies took like half my paycheck for the most part. And that was for me to be able to like move on and move up okay in in the corporate world so different though but you so they had nannies but wow one, just one okay no, but, i don't want to imply that we were but interesting because in, in your parents were working to get this restaurant going and you were the it was like you had they had to rely on you to take care of the younger siblings but as it was kind of similar you're working now a right. lot your husband's working but maybe the finances were a little different so you right. you were so fortunate we were to get a nanny so your uh, again, kids were able to focus a little more on the academics and the... They were. They were able to focus a little more. And then, you know, it was like, okay, so if I'm out of the home and I'm like working myself and my husband, we're both working like dogs and we're getting home. We're like <sighs> dragging our tongues, <laughs> wanting to just rest. Like, I didn't want to spend my weekends doing laundry. I wanted to see my kids yeah. and not like get home and have them be up for an hour. And then now they have to get ready for bed and check their homework and this and that and the other. So, you know, we tried our best to, you know, really be there with them. Yeah, sounds um, like you did. Spend quality time with them. Yeah, it sounds like you did. And also, that's it, it, what's interesting is, I guess what I'm putting together is, it's the same idea that people think, oh, okay, people with money um, or, or have it easier. But when your parents were first immigrated here, they brought their baby, they had no money but they busted their butt and opened the restaurant. They had to work around the clock, 4 a.m. And then you had to pick up some of that. There was no, they, they couldn't have a nanny. They, they had to, just to make it happen. But then that chain by their hard work and right. yours broke by you busting your butt and getting to college, meeting your husband, him coming to him, busting his yeah. butt. Yeah. Now you're still working your butts off, but now there's a nanny where your kids get the weekends with you. So you're bra you're elevating is what I'm saying. And that's I, the hope. I mean, that's I, the hope. Yeah. I'm kind of laying the groundwork and I'm cognizant of the fact that I may not live to see, you know, that whatever it is, that great, this is going to be, you know, two, three generations down the road, but I know that will be better. Mm, and it'll I be worth it. Think you're already living it. <laughs> no, no, I mean, right? I mean, yeah. I hope we're all living it. Yeah, we haven't reached Donald Trump's pockets. I don't have billions of dollars, right. but, but we've reached it, right? We've but reached the American it. dream. Right. We're, we're getting better. Each generation mm -hmm. is, uh, but we still work our butt off. That's what I, uh, the message I guess I'm trying to get out is it never gets easy. No. I don't think. And I, think I don't know. that when you have such an entrenched hard work ethic even when you want to slow down you can't yeah that's just not in your nature <laughs> you're grinding yeah my parents the same thing they as a result of their of their work and the money that they were able to save up they bought a few properties they maintain maintain them to this day wow my mother will be there with a flashlight in hand while my father is underneath some <laughs> fixing sink it. fixing something i love it and that's just the way they are yeah yeah well uh, uh, god willing we never lose that I believe that is what it's about, right? It's, it's, it's never pulling back. We stay alive by, by being active. I think success comes to those that go and get it. And, and I say this when people say rich people have it so easy. I go, you know, I, I don't know that because I'm not rich. I'm not a billionaire. Listen, but I don't think they do. More money, I, more problems. Yeah. Honestly. I, I, yes. Uh, it sounds like your parents worked hard. You and your husband work hard. And your kids are working hard. And, and We hope the intergenerational wealth that we've planted will continue to grow. That's yeah. all that we can hope for. I love that. Now, before I close, um, I heard that you dabbled in acting. And uh, you actually did a Kmart commercial. Uh, yeah, I don't know that if you want. It wasn't really acting. It was more like a, more like you know this. They they set out a a, a casting call of mm -hmm. some kind, and someone said, "Hey, look, I found this. You want to do it?" And I did. So that was that was fun. That's acting. That's <laughs> and you're gonna see a clip of it. I hope. Um, Lola, thank you for having us at your home. It's been an honor. Your story is incredible. Thank uh, you for I, coming. 
hopefully many people get what they need out of it. And uh, congratulations on everything and all your successes. Thank you so much. Thank you. And I would just encourage everyone to be a mentor or find a mentor. Always put out good energy. Do unto others as you want them done to do unto you and your children if you have them. And, you know, always look forward. There it is. There it is there. Get to the core. Uh, This is our podcast, New York Edition. We just talked with Lola, and we're excited for you to see what's coming up next. Hey, everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Make sure to tune in on this next episode. We're sitting down with Mark. Mark went from being an assistant in a plumbing company to owning one of the most successful plumbing companies in Long Beach. Truly inspiring. Check it out. You should never stress about the problems you be facing. Everybody in the mud on the struggle trying to make it. Look into the mirror and you see your motivation. Then you step into the world and you find your inspiration. I'm finding inspiration. And once I get a hold of it, I'll never get complacent. Look into the mirror and you see the motivation. Then you step into the world and you find your inspiration.